being the guy who holds the purse strings is a huge responsibility. In our daily lives, we must make financial decisions that impact our families and our future and our standard of living. Is it a family holiday in Europe, renovating a home for an elderly parent, or putting aside university money for your children? All priorities, all important, but there's only one problem, and it's that money is not inf infinite. Someone who knows that money is not infinite is the Minister of Finance. He has the daunting task of deciding how to spend, save, and invest the money of 12 million people. 12 million people from different geographic regions, ages, circumstances. Some Ontarians are highly educated. Some of us are retired. Some of us are concerned about childcare. While some of us are among the wealthiest in the world, some of us depend on social assistance. Some Ontarians live in large cities, and other, others of us live in rural communities. We use roads, transits, transit schools, and electricity. Some of us have just arrived from other countries, while others of us have been here for generations. Thankfully, most of us are healthy. But some of us truly depend on our state-of-the-art health care system. Ontario is a diverse society, to say the least. We are all in this together and have entrusted our elected leaders to make macroeconomic decisions on our collective behalf. I suppose Premier Peterson, the only more difficult job than being treasurer is being the Premier. Minister Charles Souza was born and raised in Mississauga. He's been the member of provincial parliament for the riding of Mississauga South since 2007 and is the current Minister of Finance. He is a husband and a father, a former Bay Street banker, labor minister, and minister of citizenship. Minister Souza is a graduate of Wilfrid Laurier University and received his MBA from the Ivy School of Business. On Thursday of this week, Minister Souza will rise in the legislature to deliver the government's fall economic statement. Charles Souza is known for always saying, in Ontario, there is room for everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honourable Charles Souza to the Empire Club. Of well, thank you, Noble. I, uh, I appreciate the introduction. I appreciate you giving my speech. That was great. It's pretty much done. Thank you very much for coming. Actually, Noble has been doing an outstanding job for uh, a lot of years and a lot of files and a lot of initiatives. And Noble, we really appreciate your advocacy and, and uh, the work you do. So thank you so much. <laughs> I'd also like to thank our former Premier, David Peterson, who's here today in fine form. The guy's looking better with age. In fact, he, does, he looks the same as he always did almost as good as Hazel McCallion. <laughs> Not at all. Listen, I, I have such great respect for our former Premier for all that he's been doing. And more importantly, this man gives back to the community in a huge way. And now as chair of the Pan Am and Parapan American Games, of which he was instrumental in landing, he is now the biggest cheerleader there is to ensure that those games make Ontario proud. Mr. Peterson, we're proud of you, so thank you for what you do. But of course, the former Premier didn't come alone. He had to bring some backup. He brought his former minister, Bob Wong, who's here today. Where are you, Bob? There he is. Thank you so much for being here. And I think Steve Mahoney is here as well, who's been involved in every order of government. Thank you, Steve. I, um, as a treasurer, I have, uh, I have a boardroom, and in the boardroom there's all kinds of pictures, and I look at this woman almost every day, and to have her here again today, live, is such a great pleasure. Janet Ecker, former finance minister and also chair of the Toronto <laughs> Services Financial Association. I didn't come alone either. 
I brought one of my colleagues, Sue Wong, who's a parliamentary assistant to training colleges and universities, one of our newest members in caucus, and doing a fantastic job. Actually, she replaced a prince of a man. This individual has been with us a long time, even during the days of David Peterson. And I should tell you that this gent continues to work for us still. He was former chair of the Treasury Board. He was minister of pretty much everything in, the, in government. And he continues today to help me as a mentor and as a guide. And he sits on my Treasury Board still doing God's work. Thank you so much, Jerry Phillips. Where are you? Right here. Of course, there's a lot of distinguished guests here as well. And I just want to welcome all of you. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking time out of what I'm sure is a very busy day for all of you. I know, and you know, that I've been treasurer for about a year now. I gotta tell you, my life has changed quite a bit. My youngest daughter of three is a teenager. So some of you who are parents of teenagers will appreciate this. I'm not really used to people paying close attention when I'm speaking. She didn't even come here today. <laughs> so before I begin, I, I just want to say thank you for listening. And I uh, want to thank my son, who did come. So thank you, Justin, for being here today. <laughs> I also want to thank all of you for all you do, day in and day out. And the work that you do and the jobs that your work supports to build a stronger Ontario, a more compassionate Ontario a fairer Ontario. Later this week, our government, under the leadership of Premier Kathleen Wynne, will be tabling our fall economic statement. Today, I want not so much to provide you a foretaste of the contents of the statement, though I may do a bit of that, but mostly to talk about the context, the careful deliberation, and the planning that has gone into creating our new economic plan. First, though, let me tell you what it is not. It is not a plan that supports drastic cuts, across the board cuts to vital programs and services that Ontarians rely on and that families require, and that support a strong economy. We know that this is what some have done in the past and suggest we do again. We reject that approach. And we reject it both on principle and on experience. When we took office in 2003, we had three deficits to contend with more than a $5 billion fiscal deficit, which the previous government had run up and hid, despite relatively good times, in a strong global economy, no less. There was an education deficit, caused by years of neglect and cutbacks in the classroom. That meant untold hours of instruction loss to a generation of Ontario students, and an infrastructure deficit in the forms of crumbling bridges, poorly maintained roads and highways, and chronically underfunded and inadequate transit. It has taken us a decade of hard work and strategic investments to begin to repair that unfortunate legacy. And while we have introduced successive balanced budgets in good economic times, the realities that the global recession has placed at Ontario's doorstep have meant we find ourselves in a fiscal deficit, like so many others. But the good news is that we have a solid plan to grow our economy, and we are on track to balance the budget by 2017-18. In the other two areas, education and infrastructure, we have also made significant progress. Despite today's economic challenges, we choose to continue to invest in our future. Today, across Ontario, more students are graduating from high school than ever before. More students are going to post-secondary than ever before. Test scores are higher. Class sizes are lower. And Ontario's education system is internationally recognized as one of the best in the world. This means that our young people are better equipped, better trained, 
and better able to compete in a global economy that prizes innovation, education, and, entre and entrepreneurship more than ever. We've also introduced new programs that increase financial literacy in our schools. And as finance minister, that's encouraging. And to address the infrastructure deficit, we have refurbished 7,900 kilometers of roads and highways, enough to stretch from Toronto to Calgary and back. We've added new trains, longer trains, more trains, including 30-minute all-day service on the vital Go Transit corridor that helps alleviate traffic on our highways. And it gets goods and people moving more quickly and more safely, as well as providing better public transit within communities, big and small, all across Ontario. And our partners at Metrolinx have done a tremendous job in that regard. And yet, we need to do even more, which is why last week we announced that Ontario will be the first province in Canada to develop and sell green bonds. The proceeds from these bonds will be directly invested in transit and in environmentally friendly projects right across our province. But we're not done. More needs to be done. I live in Mississauga. I'm a commuter. And I can tell you, I spent so much time looking at people's cars on the Gardner Expressway that I think I've read every bumper sticker in Ontario. And we're all there, stuck, just trying to get to work. I even had the opportunity to hear the Premier and Daryl Dahmer give a bird's eye live traffic report, further reinforcing the critical need for us to invest. This logjam costs our economy $6 billion per year in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area alone. And we all feel the effects. So when other parties call for drastic cuts, especially given that we're, we are the only government in over a decade to have actually reduced total spending. And the fact is that we are already the lowest cost government anywhere in Canada. So I can only think of the chaos that reckless cuts would cause to our economy. I think of the increased loss to our productivity. I think of the nurses and doctors out of work and how it would hurt our ability to care for our seniors, our sick, and our vulnerable. And I think of the brownouts and the blackouts we suffered. I think of the years we lost in our schools and how hard and how long we fought to restore fairness and create greater competitiveness. So we reject that approach on principle. Ontarians know that cuts made are only expenditures delayed. Simply kicking the can down the road for future governments to deal with, that's unacceptable. People reject that nearsighted vision, and so do we. And then there are others who suggest uncontrolled spending and reckless taxes on our job-creating businesses, just at a time when the global economy is in the midst of a fragile recovery. We reject that approach, too, on principle. Because Ontario families rely on those jobs. They rely on our businesses and entrepreneurs to thrive and compete, and on our ability to attract new investment. As today's Ontario government, we have a different principle. One that is informed by a practical and pragmatic approach to the new realities of a highly competitive and global economy. One that leverages the competitive strengths we have all worked so hard to achieve. We will reduce Ontario's net debt to GDP ratio to its pre-recessions level of 27%. This is a measure of our ability to afford debt because we cannot afford to pass that burden on to our children, even if they don't always listen to me, or you. We will grow our economy. Stronger growth and new jobs is the surest, fastest path to higher revenues and a balanced budget. Not drastic cuts or business-killing taxes, but by growing the economy and creating jobs. And as we do, we will continue to provide predictability and stability for Ontarians and our businesses. And we will continue working hard to strengthen and ensure that all regions of this province benefit from a strong and growing economy. 
we will also continue to take action to reduce costs for consumers, particularly when it comes to auto insurance. Our strategy calls for a 15% reduction in auto rates on average. Last week, I received an interim report from Justice Cunningham on ways to improve the dispute resolu resolution system. The system suffered a significant backlog delaying support for victims. And that backlog keeps costs high. We must correct that. Mr. Cunningham has outlined recommendations towards a quicker and more efficient model for resolving those disputes. In the next few weeks, we'll release the report and work with our partners to get it done. Responsibility and fairness. Those are the principles that guide us. And they're not only the principles of our government, not only the principles embraced by Ontario families, I share them as well. I'm a son of immigrants. I was born just a few blocks away in Kensington Market. My parents came here from Portugal because they saw Ontario as a place of opportunity. As my dad likes to say, he still does, he's 88 years old, he says this, Noble mentioned it just briefly, and it wasn't me, Noble, it's the old man. He says, in Ontario, there is room for everyone. Room for everyone to compete and do business. Room to learn. And above all, room to help one another. I stand before you as proof that he was right. Dad, take a bow. What a ham. <laughs> My son didn't even do that. You see that? Because of him, I had that opportunity. I attended Ontario public schools. I got my degrees from Ontario's publicly funded universities. I worked in Ontario's thriving financial sector, one of the strongest in the world. My children were born in Ontario's public hospitals. And at every step of the way, throughout my whole life, I've been given the room to compete and do business, to learn and to help others. What is remarkable about that story is how typical it is, how it is shared by so many of us in this room and across our province. Friends, you have invested in my family, and I have invested in yours. And that's the way it should be, because we know that working together, we can achieve so much more than we can alone. And that, that is the beauty of Ontario. It is a place that is as compassionate as it is competitive, as fair as it is prosperous. And that balance, one that is at the heart of our civil society, is just as important as the financial balance on the books, because it is also a competitive advantage in the global economy. And our Ontario Liberal government will protect that balance always. And at the same time, we'll continue to create an economic climate that allows Ontario's businesses to thrive. Already, we have created a stable and competitive business climate by cutting taxes, which includes reducing corporate income tax and eliminating the capital tax. This encourages new business investment and helps to create jobs. We also just introduced legislation to cut employer health tax for 60,000 more small businesses. And if passed, began, beginning on January 1, almost 90% of Ontario businesses would not pay this tax. But as we head towards January, the opposition have been holding up this bill. These political games will hurt small businesses right across our province. Our measures have allowed businesses to save money, to keep it on their books for them to eventually invest in new equipment and machinery to become even more competitive and productive, in people to train and hire them to achieve even greater success. But here again, Ontario needs to do more. I think many of you have 
been aware of recent studies and reports by Deloitte, CIBC, and others that show many companies are not taking advantage of the opportunities to expand, innovate, and improve their productivity. Instead, many companies are holding high levels of cash, holding back on these very investments. As a former banker, I appreciate the contradiction here. On the one hand, having cash on the books can be a good thing, given it's a function of working capital. A strong balance sheet provides businesses with greater security and positions them for growth, provided that surplus cash is invested. Because not doing so is what limits our competitiveness. In an uncertain global economy, in a fragile recovery, certainly a measured approach to new investment makes sense. However, at the same time, we cannot ignore the reality that exists in other parts of the world who are making those investments. The majority of the U.S. states provide R&D tax credits targeted to incremental R&D expenditures. Ontario's can and Ontario and Canada's R&D spending as a proportion of GDP remains significantly lower than that of the United States. That, in turn, allows the U.S. competitors to produce goods and services more productively. This is a race. We can't fall behind. We can't falter, and we can't be faint of heart. Just as our government is making the necessary investments in health care and education and infrastructure so that Ontario has a solid backbone to compete and win in the global economy, as Ontarians, we're always striving to work together. The government will play our part, but it's businesses that create jobs. So we'll do more to help them, to become even more competitive, by encouraging investments in new machinery and equipment and in other ways to boost productivity. We'll consider measures already taken by other parts of the world to promote capital investment. These include R&D tax credits to reward additional spending and the play or pay tax incentive for new spending in equipment, technology, and training. We'll also partner with industry to measure and report on those investments in innovation, training, and technology and showcase top performers against international benchmarks. We'll do so because we know, on principle, we can't cut our way to success, because that only results in a race to the bottom. We can't tax our way to success, because that strangles our ability to compete. We can only grow our way to success by creating an environment that our job-producing businesses need to succeed. That, in turn, supports the strong economy we need, which, in turn, supports our vital public services, like health care and education, that our families, yours and mine, depend upon. That's the principle we'll follow. That is an approach that is fair and balanced in every sense of the word. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an important time for Ontario. As the world recovers, as the challenges and changes in the global economy continue to play themselves out, we won't sit still. We in Ontario are leading the way to finding a Canada-wide agreement on CPP enhancement. Last week, I met with other finance ministers, and for the first time, we agreed on a set of objectives on how to move forward on pension reform. We've also recently made headway on a cooperative securities regulator. Ontario, along with British Columbia and the federal government, have established a framework to have a more competitive and effective system. That is not only good for Ontario, it is also about building a stronger nation for people and businesses all across Canada. We will not rest on what we've achieved together, though, we will continue to invest. We will not cut for the sake of cutting. Those actions that hurt families and take our economy backwards are not where we're going to go. We will continue to build and improve our productivity and encourage businesses to invest and create more jobs. We remain on track to balancing the budget by 2017-18 because we will continue to create the conditions for economic growth by investing in people building modern infrastructure, 
and supporting a dynamic and innovative business climate. And we'll do this in a way that is fair, that is balanced and principled. And we'll ensure that Ontario remains what it has always been, a place where there is room for everyone, room for everyone to compete and do business, room to learn, and above all, room to help one another. Thank you. The, the minister has agreed to take a number of questions, uh, so we have a couple of mics that are roaming around. Um, we'll do about 10 minutes of this, so uh, if you have a question, uh, please identify yourself. There's a question in the far corner over there. Um, if you uh, please identify yourself to the minister and uh, ask your question. Uh, good afternoon. I'm um, Andy Harjula from um, the Peterborough area, and I was wondering uh, how are you going to reconcile uh, the next budget in view of the fact that the um, uh, wind turbines and the solar program is uh, spending far, far more money than uh, what we, the ratepayers, are paying. For example, my neighbor, he has a solar panel on his barn. He's paid 81 cents per kilowatt. When that uh, power comes to my house, I pay 9 cents. Who pays the difference to 72 cents? So the degree of uh, mix in the Ontario energy supply, uh, renewables and what you speak of is around 2% of the overall mix. The majority is a base supply from nuclear around 50%. Hydro is another 30%, and then we have gas plants as well. What's important is the degree of, of, in, of investments made in greater transmission and greater support for our electricity system. The grid is now has great integrity, uh, which it didn't have before. And these are massive investments that are made annually. It's around $35 billion on an annual basis. So the degree of the mix that you speak of is actually a minor consequence with the overall issue, and it's, of course, melded together. But what you should know is that uh, we have made a bold decision as a government and as a province to get out of dirty coal. It was the worst polluter that we've had in this province, and for that matter, in the country. And those things are changing as a result of the actions that we've taken, creating even greater uh, prosperity in the midst of those new manufacturings that are coming forward and reducing the level of hospital care in cases that we're also tasking our system much more and much more expensively than we are now. So it's a, it's a balance that we've taken, it's a decision that we've made to improve our quality of life and our health care and our future generations. And in the end, we'll continue to invest in those initiatives to ensure that we have greater degree of um, of less requirement for energy. In the end, that is even what's going to make us uh, more competitive, is by reducing the needs of energy. But we'll continue to do what we need there. Michael McHugh, could you please comment on the priorities for health care reform for the province? It's a great question, because health care is the largest component of our budget. The budget's about $127 billion a year. Health care represents well over almost a half of that. And we need to take some transformational changes. Uh, we uh, commissioned a report, uh, some may know Don Drummond and the report that he brought forward on reform and how to do some transformational changes to improve the delivery of services without sacrificing quality. We've now implemented almost 60% or on track to doing 60% of those recommendations of which health care is a major component. Home care is a big part of that. Finding ways to get more care to people where they need it, when they need it. And try to find ways to promote uh, health uh, 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 prevention as another means. Uh, so there is a number of initiatives that are already underway to facilitate and reduce the requirements of health care. Uh, we need to find a way to, to support our aging population, which is the greatest uh, need of health at this point. So that's why those transformational changes are being made. 
at a time when they want it to, because people would prefer to stay home as long as they can. Any other questions? Come on now, I, I'm kind of having withdrawals from not being at question period today. <laughs> There's one over there. Thank you, Minister. Is this on? Great. Um, with respect to SMEs, which traditionally seem to be recognized as the largest source of growth and innovation in any jurisdiction, not just ours, um, I see that we've been making at various government levels supports for accelerators and incubators. That's noble. And we've been trying to beef up the venture capital side. And obviously, we have very strong public markets to carry on in, this, in the continuum of capital market formation or capital formation in the country. What we seem to be missing, though, is that element between the early stage startup and the venture capitalists. And primarily, this is where angel investors historically have filled the void. And that also is the, the home of where they call this Death Valley, which acts as the sort of the, where the runway uh, stops and a lot of the companies fail and we don't therefore have the productivity and the innovation we should. What's your government and what's your view on how we should go and bolster that intermediary uh, angel class to sort of try to make it stronger, make it more dynamic, improve yeah. job growth, et cetera? Thanks. It's a good question. The, um, there's a number of uh, clusters that we're developing I just uh, announced last week uh, the aerospace cluster that we're working with, the, with Centennial College to try to promote uh, more initiatives with the industry and with education and promote those skills. But we also are dealing with entrepreneurs and trying to bring to market those incubated uh, uh, opportunities. And I can think of Communitech in Waterloo. So you have the Perimeter Institute that generates great ideas. You've got quantum research at the University of Waterloo. You've got a number of, of individuals coming up with neat and innovative ideas. You have Google, and you've got a number of major companies now coming to the forefront. What we need to do is find ways to put a suit around those ideas, enable incubation by way of venture capital or mezzanine financing or other forms of access to, to funding so that these companies can come to fruition. We have some great successes now that's happening in Waterloo, and the province of Ontario has been a major contributor and uh, an investor in, in these initiatives, and these are the things that we're going to build upon and uh, promote because we know that that's the only way we can start up some of these uh, companies here in Ontario. And we have, in fact, I should say, one of those individuals who actually sits on my economic advisory board, when a young Canadian, a young Ontarian, providing his spirit of entrepreneurship and vision, because they see things differently than we at times do. And we need to have those collision of ideas and more importantly, find ways to promote them. So we have to find some capital and we have greater access to funding. You just gotta find a way of marrying them up and getting those mentorship programs. In the budget last year, I introduced $275 million fund to help young people who have graduated looking for skills. Part of that fund is a component amount for entrepreneurship and innovation. And now that's being accessed to help do things just as you've, you've explained. So it's a great idea. Thank you, Minister. I think we're out of time for questions. I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to call upon Mr. Christopher May from the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario to formally thank you. Thank you, Noble. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. As you've just heard, my name is Christopher May. I'm the Director of Government Affairs with Ontario's Chartered Professional Accountants. On behalf of our assembled guests here today, Minister, I'd like to thank you for your thought-provoking speech concerning Ontario's economic fundamentals. Minister, there is no secret to your commitment to innovation, to encouraging business investment in this province, and ensuring Ontario continues to have the economic fundamentals to attain those goals. From the perspective of the CPA profession, we support all efforts that foster Ontario's competitive advantage. On behalf of Ontario's almost 37,000 CPA CAs and 6,000 CPA CA students, I'd like to say that we are honored to support the Empire Club of Canada in its efforts to bring Canadians face to face with prominent public policy makers and the issues that shape Ontario. So thank you, Minister, for making room for all of us to be part of this important public policy dialogue with you.
Thank you. And on behalf of the club minister, as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to present you with this book. It's called Who Said That? Memorable Notes, Quotes, and Anecdotes, a Selected Empire Club Speeches from the Last Hundred Years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, at your tables, you'll see that we have a number of upcoming events. One is tomorrow, actually, with uh, Linda Hasenfras, CEO of Linamar Corporation at the Royal York Hotel. I'd like to thank uh, CPA, CPA Ontario for sponsoring this event and for TELUS for sponsoring our VIP reception and the student table. I'd like to thank the National Post, our print media sponsor, uh, Van Valkenburg for our audio visual. This meeting will be carried and aired on Rogers TV and we are grateful for your ongoing support as well. We are on Twitter and on Facebook and membership information is available uh, at our website at empireclub.org. Thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, this meeting of the Empire Club of Canada is now adjourned.